Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to the FocusWire Global Startup Showcase. Uh, I'm Kevin May. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at uh, FocusWire and your host as such for this uh, particular event. So uh, let me talk to you a little bit about this event before we uh, tackle the next 90 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to take you on, a, I guess you could say, a whirlwind tour of the globe and the issues affecting the travel, tourism and hospitality startup world. Um, we're doing this by virtue of working with our comrades at uh, Focus Right and uh, Web in Travel. For those of you that don't know those, they are the preeminent events and research businesses in the industry. And uh, what we're going to do is bring you a series of uh, discussions and panels with some of the key figures in the world of startups, certainly from the investment side. And we're also going to be talking to some of the brands, those startups themselves to get their perspective. Now, obviously, uh, what's the context for all this? Well, we're doing it online. That leads most of you to believe it's another online event. You know, unless you have been hiding under a rock for the last six months, our industry, like most businesses around the world and the society at large, lest we forget, has been hit by the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, travel startups uh, arguably are at the sharp end of all this, some without the traction of some of the larger peers, ready access to capital to help them through things and uh, you know their business like most businesses in the travel industry have essentially dried up overnight as we all know we're you know three or four months into this now so but equally this is i think an important point they are perhaps not saddled down with the large corporate structures that their larger peers are saddled down with uh, so they can actually move easily to adapt to sometimes the new set of circumstances that they find themselves in. So we want to explore both the challenges and, as I said, importantly, the opportunities that are emerging for some of these companies that are perhaps uh, only just launched or those that have got a few years behind them already. Right. So joining me as your hosts are going to be uh, Pete Como. He's my boss. He's the, uh, the head of Focus Right. And also Maurice True and uh, Yeo Su Hoon from Web in Travel, who will be moderating their own sessions as we kind of navigate our way through the next uh, 90 minutes, as I said. You'll hear from uh, Queens Road Capital, Arbor Ventures, Thayer Ventures, uh, Vitruvian Partners. Those are the reps from the, uh, uh, the investment side. Our startups will be represented by Split, Bespoke, Setu, Zizu, Eralo, and Troop Travel. Unfortunately, time is pretty tight, as you can see from this 90-minute agenda with lots to pack in. So we don't really have uh, an opportunity for a formal Q&A, but you can leave your comments by hitting the uh, chat function. Many, many of you will be very familiar with the world of Zoom now, and you can uh, send me comments using that. But here at Focus Wire, we're always keen on, hear on, on hearing your stories. So you can get in touch with us and tell, you know, share some of your feedback about not only this event, but also how you've been navigating the last three or four months. You can do that directly by uh, coming to us at uh, editor at focuswire.com. So once we've got through this, we've got some details about the Battleground event and some of Web and Travel's events coming up. We'll come to all that at the end of it. However, I get the honor of the, uh, the first uh, session that uh, we're going to be hosting uh, for you over the next uh, 20 minutes. And if we could fire up the videos for Ben Johnson from Vitruvian Partners and uh, Chris Hemeter from Thayer Ventures, uh, who will be joining us here. So thank you very much, fellas, for, for, for joining me this morning, especially to you, Chris, because it is terrifyingly early for you in San Francisco. What? Are you, are you talking to me? Coast. <laughs> yes, talking to you. Uh, I'm glad you've had your ninth <laughs> cup of your ninth cup of coffee. I would imagine already. So thanks so you know, much. I, re I realized that I, when I was in the shower this morning, that I missed jet lag, and so this has been a nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all part of the service that we offer here for you, Chris. Anyway, no, but th thanks ever so much, Ben. And Chris. Right. So, um, looking through the lens of investors, let's uh, let's start with um, with yourself, Chris. If you could just kind of give us your kind of perspective, really on. You know, a lot of the people that are tuning in, entrepreneurs and established companies, probably want to get a sense of where the investment world is at the moment. Is it a watching brief as to see what's going on, or are you already starting to, you know, move your chess pieces, which we know, you know, those in the investment community are very good at doing? What kind of what kind of phase are you in? No, I, I mean it's an important question, and and we are active. Um, we believe that this is an unprecedented time, frankly, for startups and for investment opportunity. The, the level of experimentation and demand for tech now in travel supply is stronger than ever. Interestingly enough, 
back in 2019 when many travel suppliers were seeing you know record performance numbers there was this sort of drag on experimentation on attitude of if it ain't broke don't fix it um, and now it seems that there is an extreme interest in automation in ways to cut costs, different ways to manage channel and, and so forth. So really interesting time for startups. That said, the major underwriting var variable that we all struggle with is time. And coronavirus has blown a huge hole in our modeling of time. We're, we're unsure when early experimentation will turn into sustained revenue growth. And so you're seeing that in the pricing of deals. And, and, you know, when entrepreneurs think about valuation, you know, it's not so much that investors are just sharks in the water trying to take advantage of this time, but, you know, we have a fiduciary duty to try to underwrite these businesses and time is the critical variable that drives our underwriting and time is uncertain right now. And so, yeah. you know, it's an interesting time, very challenging. Okay, Ben, um, you're in a different kind of a spot because you invest in companies that have got a, a, a longer track record, if we can put it that way. But, you know, you are still investors in companies. I mean, is it the same perspective as what, uh, uh, what Chris has just shared with us? Or do you approach things in a different way because many of the companies that you invest in, like I said, have that track record? It's a great question. I think Chris has nailed most of it. I think at the younger end, you'd hope that things continue more as normal with you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and the disruptive opportunity still there, despite the, uh, the challenges. At the later stage end, the world has changed very dramatically. You think of all the companies that raise larger and larger rounds at higher and higher valuations and ever, ever upward, uh, you know, line of revenue, you know, they've hit an earthquake. And in that earthquake, there's sort of an immediate effect where a few buildings fall down and there's a bunch of buildings and companies that are damaged. And we just don't know yet whether they're repairable or whether, you know, they're going to fall. And I think that that's back to Chris's point. It's going to take a quarter or two at least for us to see, you know, to use the, to take the metaphor further, whether there's an, another earthquake or a mini shake that uh, caused them to fall. So I think at the larger end, the only type of investments you'll see will really be rescue financings. And it's not a secret that, uh, you know, a car trawler changed hands recently uh, unexpectedly due to the effect of the crisis. But generally speaking, you wouldn't raise money now unless you had to. Uh, and if you don't have to, you should wait. Just on that point then, Chris, don't raise money if you have to, but would you advise the same to companies that are lower down the ladder of their lifespan? Absolutely, 100%. It be, again, because th that the uncertainty of time is going to be driven into the price. And so people who have to close around in you know, June, July, and August are, gonna, are just going to have to, if they can even get it done, are going to have to absorb substantial price pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think that the interesting thing is in, this, in, the, in the phase of sort of growth and, and startup work businesses, those companies that had substantial revenue and so you know, much of their balance sheet was a function of expectation of revenue, are suffering way more than many startups that were still in the experimentation beta stage because they didn't have a high degree of dependence on revenue. So when revenue goes to zero, they actually can cut costs to overcome uh, uh, that challenge and extend their runway. And so, you know, our advice to any uh, early stage company is if you can extend your runway deep into 2021, you should. If you need to get any financing done to bridge yourself to that zone, get it from your inside investors. Um, the only kinds of companies that are out there actively raising money right now are ones that are, you know, sort of the counterintuitive businesses that are actually thriving and are accelerating specifically as a result of, of coronavirus. And, and they're seeing robust interest. There, there's still a lot of active capital around the table. Now, what's interesting in, the, <clears throat> uh, Ben, if we can come to you on this one, uh, Chris was saying, you know, if you can get yourself through to 2021, um, lean on your existing investment, lean may be the wrong word, but, you know, talk to your existing investors, essentially to get cash flow. And often yeah. cash flow is not something that you ask your investor for. Your investor for is, is growth capital, right? So is there an appetite in the investment world to just give people cash flow for survival money? Absolutely. If, if it's a good venture that's been hit by a one in a hundred year event, 
you should want to protect that business to get through to the other side of the um, the, the, the the event. Um, but just absolutely. sorry, just uh, just just on that though, it is still so uncertain though. It's not just to get you well, through. This to is why I, I think you have to differentiate between businesses that were doing well going into the crisis and those what were a question mark or disappointing. The disappointing ones or the ones which were not hadn't found their product market fit or weren't scaling the way we'd all want. You know, this could be the event that stops them progressing. But for the companies that were doing well and out of the blue, you know, lightning struck, you know, it's rational and it's the right thing to do <coughs> to support those companies to let them start again back on the same track in six, 12 months time. And you don't want to give that company up to somebody else because you believe in it and it has a great chance of success. And it took a COVID like crisis to knock it off course. That's not true of many companies that are disappointing. Yeah, and I think that that is a fundamental example of the benefit of institutional investors is that we hold reserves for the companies we invest in specifically to either follow on when they're rocketing so that we can you know, you know, continue to put money to work in good companies or to protect them and help them during these unprecedented times where a lot of individual investors or even corporate investors are not necessarily structured around reserves. So all of a sudden when lightning strikes and a company is saying, hey, I just got to get bridged through this disaster, but we know it's a great company. You know, if your investor isn't structured to follow on and doesn't understand that, it can be a very difficult time. Now, you know, it's... <laughs> It's a common question. We've heard it on many of these similar things for other industries. These kind of what are comp what are investors looking for? What should new businesses be kind of thinking about? You kind of started, kind of hinted at this a little bit, Chris, in your in your in your first response, which was around automation. Now, that's not an easy thing to just suddenly start trying to do, is it? You know, you can't suddenly just dream up a company that helps with automation. Or would you disagree? Because Arguably, I mean, we've spoken to a couple of companies that are already coming up with ideas around hygiene and cleanliness and things like that in the travel industry and are coming up with business plans that kind of tackle that. And they've done that within a couple of months, which does seem perhaps ambitious or perhaps it isn't. What would you say? Well, I, you know, I'm not so sure I would see a, a business that was solely focused on some sort of narrow cleanliness story as being a sustainable business. I, I, I see that as a reaction to the times. I'm not sure if <clears throat> after we have a vaccine or even substantial treatments that, that affect the outcomes of coronavirus, that we're going to see a long-term obsession by consumers of, for cleanliness. I think that Unfortunately, the pendulum will sling, swing back and we're living in a world where, where we have recency bias right now. And so, so I would not necessarily see, you know, I mean, I could be easily proven wrong because I haven't seen every business plan around cleanliness. But, you know, when we think of automation, it's not just robotics. It's not, you know, the idea of just sort of auto, you know, changing humans out for robots. But it's, you know, software that, that, that is thoughtful and is able to reduce either supervisory um, you know, headcount or back office headcount or other kinds of things and products and ways of doing business. And frankly, just sometimes it's just tech enabled workflows that are new. I mean, you look at some, you know, companies like Muse, which is one of our portfolio companies, cloud-based property management system. They've really rethought a lot about how hotels operate. Things like the night audit, just what is that for, right? So their software enables sort of a new way of attacking an old business uh, at, with less labor, which, you know, is an incredibly important thing for companies to, to embrace now, because I think coming out of this the travel supply and a lot of the big incumbents are going to be focused on flexibility because it may be three or four years before rev pars in the hotel business get back to 2019 levels. Now, Ben, it's, um, you know, we're talking about companies with new ideas there, your companies that you invest in, as we said at the beginning, are much further down their life cycle. And, you know, for fear of using the dreaded P word, which is pivot, you know, it, it's, they're, they're probably not in a position to suddenly just change their business model, are they? Or is there opportunity and what are you kind of sensing that they should be doing if they have to come up with something that's going to get them through maybe up to two years, possibly? I, th I think you know, th this is a time of opportunity because it takes a crisis sometimes to change direction. 
And I think about all the companies we all know that are running a business model of five, 10, 15 years ago, probably with a lot of support functions, which are manual, a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, human checking and human intervention. To Chris's point, there's an opportunity on the way out for them to rebuild their customer support, their CRM, the way they market using the new digital tools, which when they were succeeding and busy, were never a good use of time to re-engineer that stack. But on the way out, we're gonna be challenging all of our companies to rebuild in a leaner, more automated way and take advantage of all of the entrepreneurship and innovation that's out there because they're gonna have time to do that. And so I think that actually in a funny sort of way, you know, there will be a pivot, but it may not be a pivot on the front, front end with customers. It may be a pivot in the back end in the way they run their businesses and the lean way in which they rebuild coming out of this drop. And so if we can, one of the, one of the, the I guess one of the trends that was happening pre all this craziness that struck us over the last you know, four or five months is there was a tendency for fewer, and I'm talking very, very broadly now, there was a tendency for a fewer early stage investments and back in, you know, over into your world, Ben, of supporting those that had the traction. Um, is there, I, I guess gamble is the, is the wrong word, but Chris, first of all, I mean, is there a, a tendency when everything kind of goes back to zero that, you know, let's take a bet on something that is uh, a, a good idea <laughs> and we just don't know how things are going to run over the next couple of years. So let's just, you know, let's back this idea because it's kind of good, but we have, we have less of an eyesight as to how things are going to run. Is it yeah. kind of less risky, more risky, do you think? Well, I mean, you just described my, my day job. I mean, that's what we do day in and day out, right? I mean, when early stage investors, let's face it, it's not about the math. I mean, yeah, the math is important, but it's, there's a lot of art and, and, you know, as opposed to just science and startups because early stage companies, you can never really forecast. I mean, you know, w with an industry that's down and out, it's really tough to understand what's going to happen over the next 12 to 18 months. So it's difficult to forecast early growth. But there are definitely companies that are well positioned for a, you know, a post-corona world um, that are super interesting. I think both of us are investors in data companies, right? Companies that are sitting on a lot of really interesting data. And the thing that I find so interesting about that category is that in the old days, one of the greatest competitors to, to data companies was historical trends. A lot of companies would say, well, I really don't need to buy a data service because I know exactly what happened last year. In fact, I know exactly what happened on March 15th for the last 15 years. Maybe it would be a nice add-on. Now, nobody knows anything about what's happening next. The forecasting is just, you know, broken. And so data companies that are, you know, tapped into these real-time real streams of consumer sentiment and consumer data, consumer shopping, consumer booking, are going to, you know, are developing products that are allowing suppliers to have a view into what's coming. That's really interesting. And suddenly very, you know, in demand across industries, frankly, forecasting is broken. So, so there are things I think that are, you know, opportunistic and super interesting in a post-corona world. And those sometimes are worthy of bets, even though they're very early and it's really uncertain when their revenue ramps are going to begin. But that's the world that we live in, right? So, uh, Ben, if we can come to you, I mean, talk to us a little bit about the, the, the data kind of the data company end of the of yeah. what you do. Um, and then as we start kind of wrapping <clears throat> towards our terrifyingly short amount of time that we have today, I mean, give us your sense of what would be the ripe areas other than automation that you would either be interested in or those that you would avoid. Think of particular so sectors. So if I, if I compare the way we think about the world with Chris, I would say, because we're investing later in the life of the company, the challenge we're trying to overcome is, what's the sustainable competitive differentiation long-term that this good company can rely on to survive when people work out they're really onto something and becoming successful? So what's, what are the, what's the moat around the business that can protect it against these mega corporations taking it down? So that's our challenge. So with data companies, and we're investors in OAG, the hopefully you'd agree the leading aviation data company in the world. You know they've spent you know a long time building up proprietary and premium uh, quality data feeds, 
which they aggregate and use their algorithms to cleanse and to, and to perfect, and moving increasingly into predictive data that can be supply, shared with their clients, you're trying to make sure that that task is a hard task that everybody, as Chris describes, needs to know the best quality data in a very uncertain world to make decent commercial decisions. And so that's a great example where it's not a big market, but it's a very uh, big opportunity for somebody to really corner that and spend all their time and energy, you know, building a business around the niche of premium live aviation data. Now, if you take that uh, further, I would say, you know, to your second part of the question, you know, the same things are true today that were true six months ago, that in travel, it's a strange market. At the one end, you have an oligopoly layer of, you know, the supply chain of a small number of hotels, a small number of airlines, a small number of car hire companies, et cetera. And then you have these big platforms like Expedia and Google and others and Ctrip who dominate the other end. So trying to compete with either of those type of players in supplier demand is a challenging thing to do because they have scale. So we found a lot more fertile investment area in the middle where you're connecting up the fragmentation and providing essential services and technology to a vibrant ecosystem. Trying to be the next Expedia seems to us a bigger challenge than providing tools to 100,000 companies, you know, trying different strategies in this market. So we'll give you the uh, final word, Chris, as you've got up so early for us this morning on the West Coast there. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you largely agree. I mean, we, we, when you and I have spoken in the past, it's B2B is, is, a, is a much more obvious place to, uh, to be looking before any of this all happened, just because of the, the consumer facing world, unless you've got something that's really unique or new, you're going to face a tough time. Yeah. But, but I think that there there are opportunities in supply. I mean, I think that, that you know, Sonder is a, re is a really interesting example of, of, of a very high growth accelerating, you know, global business in the supply side of things. So, you know, things happening in and around accommodations are generally creating opportunities. Lighthouse Hotels is another early stage investment of ours. Um, very, you know, tech integrated, uh, tech forward um, management company for small hotels. And so, you know, we do like um, consumer stuff, but more on the supply side. I think it, you know, competing in the top of the funnel around travel planning and travel inspiration is, is something that, that we, we still consider pretty spooky. Um, maybe that's the game for, you know, big funds that can back those guys to a gazillion, you know, uh, users, but that's not us. I think that the opportunity really is, I mean, look, the travel industry, you know, capital T, right, it is so dynamic and so huge. And it has been undergoing disruption and dislocation for a while. Historically, it's been resistant to the adoption of technology. So there's a lot of legacy practice in there. Uh, and it's a radical change in the way consumers are consuming travel, whether it's business, leisure or otherwise. And so there's just so many interesting opportunities across the value chain and there, continue, there will continue to be. And also transportation. Okay. I mean, we also focus in transportation, which is super interesting. Yeah, Urban absolutely. Right. So okay. So this is the first part of uh, our investor chat. There'll be one at the other end of uh, today's uh, uh, session. So it only goes for me to say thank you to Ben and thank you to Chris, uh, especially for joining us so early. And it's, it's nice to have a fellow Brit on a panel for, for the first time in ages. So thank you very, thank you very much, Ben and Chris. So uh, thank you. Any, you can find out about all about their companies and their investment funds by going to their websites. Of course, those are the obvious things to do. And it goes for me to say thanks again and to introduce Marissa True from Web in Travel. Thank you very much, Marissa. It's all, it's all yours. Thanks, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone from Singapore. Um, I'd also like to welcome my panelists, which are Dylan Tan, co-founder and CEO of Split, and Akemi Sunagala, CEO of Bespoke Inc. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, Bespoke Inc. is a multilingual AI chatbot service, um, and Split is an online payment startup that allows customers to pay in installments. Um, with my questions, I'd like to start at the very beginning. Um, I want to ask, basically, as COVID unfolded, how did both of you first respond to your businesses? So when did you realize you needed to pivot your business and how did you initially react? Uh, Dylan, let's start with you. Yeah, there were a lot of sleepless nights when we were watching our revenues drop uh, in a span of a couple of weeks. 
Um, and that was when we sort of realized that there's no way our revenues are going to uh, sustain our business if we had continued this way. And then we just made a decision to just change our business model. And the Kemi, what about yourself? So um, for us, like uh, in late January, um, I was I had to be at Heathrow Airport and I was very worried about just getting to the airport and started doing quick research. Um, but then I quickly realized that like a lot of information we could find online was like not really reliable. So I asked my team to um, create like a simple version of like COVID-19 chatbot. So when I got off the plane, that was ready to go. So we released that first, and then that way we could collect like, um, you know, sample questions to prepare a new engine to deal with the COVID-19 questions. So that was kind of like the beginning. Then in late March, um, we kind of like shifted our focus to book, um, handle like COVID-19 questions rather than like over tourism and all that stuff. So in the last panel, we sort of heard pivot being used as a semi-dirty word as something that you don't necessarily want to do with your business if you can avoid it. But both of your businesses have actually pivoted. So Dylan, I also want to ask you, what demands are you, like, are, is Split currently fulfilling and addressing? Yeah, for the listeners out there, Split allows businesses to offer, well, it used to be airlines and OTAs to offer their travelers the choice of paying in installments. Um, so when we pivoted, uh, we now allow any consumer uh, bit, uh, goods and services businesses to offer their customers the choice of paying in installments. Um, so I guess we've looked at how the uh, purchase behavior of, of consumers were shifting away from travel and into stuff they could buy online and consume at home. So that's where we started sort of serving. And we noticed that businesses were, um, well, they had to survive in some way and they were offering often unsustainable discounts. So we said to them, look, just pay us a fraction of that and we'll give you the incremental revenue from getting these customers who are a bit more budget conscious. So we basically, you changed sector altogether and then Akemi, you shifted from travel and hospitality so to health and public services. But you basically still rested on the technologies that you were using to drive your business. So... How easy was it to actually adapt to, to give out a new product? Akemi? Uh, so for us, because we still use exact same tool, just contents are um, different, right? So it was mm -hmm. pretty straightforward. It didn't take us that long. And then the biggest learning for us was actually to find a big problem to solve at the right timing. And it also needs to kind of like align with the government policies. That way governments can um, prosper. And Dylan, what about you? Right. For us, uh, well, uh, the great thing of being in, in, in payments is that it's pretty much in a industry agnostic. So we took our installment payment solution. We ripped out the parts that were connected to airlines and OTAs. We plugged in uh, the ability for us to connect to uh, websites that consumers were using every day to buy their uh, favorite goods and services to use at home. Okay. So then... I also want to ask about your growth plan. So because like you said, you're an industry agnostic areas uh, and you've been able to adapt quickly, you don't really necessarily need to have the same amount of downtime as perhaps more travel specific startups. Um, Dylan, we heard earlier this week that you, oh, actually, sorry, no, we heard earlier in the last panel that you won't raise money if you have to. So basically, you won't survive if you're desperate for funding. But Split just did actually raise some fresh funding. What do you plan to do with it? Yeah, um, so I'm mindful of how uh, numerous startups are sort of saving their cash and try to uh, um, uh, survive until the pandemic dies down. But for us, I think uh, we're solving a need for consumers and businesses today, especially during this pandemic. So we're doubling down um, and we are um, trying to accelerate our consumer uh, and uh, customer and uh, um, partner acquisition, uh, especially in the markets that we're operating in, because we've seen really good response from uh, consumers who want to pay using Split. So that's what we're going to be using our money for. And Akemi, you're actually expanding your team. So how does Bespoke actually plan to grow during this time? Right. So for a uh, short term, uh, we focus more on domestic market here, especially like public services, because that's where the money is uh, um, to like handle like COVID-19 like related issues. Uh, and then for long term, um, we're allocating more resources into emergency communication. So COVID-19 crisis was actually a good opportunity for us to um, you know, help 
talk to like partners uh, to explain like you know how important uh, emergency communication is. And given you've both sort of pivoted away from travel, do you anticipate that your businesses will eventually return to it? Are you hopeful that it's something that you can pick back up on or is it sort of something to leave in the water while you develop your business in other, in other directions? Um, okay. Absolutely. I mean, we, oh, oh, can we go ahead? Oh, no, please go, go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so absolutely. Uh, we started this company two years ago to really let more people in Southeast Asia travel for the very first time by making it really affordable. Um, and now, even though we've moved away, um, the end product remains similar. It's an installment payment solution to, let, to make purchases a bit more affordable. And we're here waiting for the travel industry to recover. And the great thing about starting in the travel industry is that we've already built those connections to the OTAs and the airlines. We'll just wait here for them as soon as they're ready to connect back to us. And you know, I don't see why we, we wouldn't go back into the travel industry in addition to what we're doing right now. So it's just a matter of time. And Akemi, what we're about We're waiting you? for you, yeah. Akemi? Yes. Uh, my answer would be yes. So currently uh, over 30% of like chat queries that we receive are about like travel restrictions. So there are so many people who are like keen to travel. They also want to know like when travel bans are going to be lifted. And then mm -hmm. the market, I feel like it always comes back and it will again. And then what happened after like Tohoku, the big earthquake here back in 2011, and then also like global economic crisis in 2019 are good examples um, the market did come back even stronger and uh, yes uh, we're definitely going back <laughs> okay so then basically the appetite is still there so I mean it sounds like both split and bespoke have come into COVID-19 in this in this pandemic sort of guns blazing because it doesn't sound like either of you are really slowing down have you guys actually faced any challenges like what has been the biggest challenge during this time for your business Dylan what about you um, so since uh, converting our business model to addressing consumer goods and services, uh, I think because of the pandemic, it accelerated the rate at which consumers and businesses were signing up to us. Um, so we hit like a, an inflection point about a couple of weeks ago where we had to start turning away customers and businesses who wanted to use Split. This is because uh, we wanted to manage our risk and make sure that we were able to serve uh, more customers over time. Uh, so that's sort of one of our limitations right now. And, and like... Uh, Chris and Ben mentioned earlier, raising capital will be a bit tougher right now. So I'm a bit mindful of that uh, to make sure we have enough, but also can scale at the rate that we want to. I mean, I guess growing pains are a good problem to have. I guess so. Akemi, what about you? So the, some of the challenges that we've been facing, it's kind of good and bad because there's so many good talents in the market right now. Um, but then with travel restrictions, we just can't relocate them to Japan. So that's probably the biggest one. So another growing pain. Um, and I guess just another case where it's a matter of time. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but one thing I want to ask each of you is what's the one piece of advice that you'd like to give other startups? Akemi, let's just stay with you for now. Sure. So I would say a crisis always creates new opportunities and, um, you know, you want to make sure uh, to chase industry where money is. And then Dylan? Um, for me, it's uh, absolute, absolutely to recognize the, the humans that are there running your startup. Um, for the founders, that includes yourself, be really mindful of your physical and mental health, especially when you're all locked up at home. Um, but more <laughs> importantly, um, also recognize the, the humans that are there helping you build your company with that common goal. Make sure that they get the care and the development that they deserve because, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you think about it, in a lockdown, it's easy for us to dehumanize each other over Slack or uh, over video calls. So just mm -hmm. be mindful of that and, um, and I think uh, preserve that human-to-human uh, -human relationship as colleagues, friends, uh, and founders. So make sure we stay close, even though we're far apart. Uh, we do actually yes. have at least a couple more minutes. So final fun question is, what's the first thing each of you want to do the moment lockdowns end and travel is finally moving again. Akemi? Okay, uh, visiting San Francisco office. <laughs> Straight to the office, is that right? I'm very worried about my people there now. <laughs> <laughs> and Dylan, what about you? 
Yeah, I used to get um, tired of business trips, but now I think I can't wait to get on a plane again and um, yeah, yeah. just travel and get out of Singapore. Yeah, I think we're all feeling a little bit of cabin fever. Well, anyway, thank you so much to you both. Um, I'd now like to pass the baton to Pete Como, Managing Director of Focus Right Inc. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa uh, and Dylan, as well as Akemi. So that was uh, a look from uh, from Asia uh, startups that are that are uh, that are based in Asia that have have been uncovered through through the Wit Network. Uh, we are shifting gears now to uh, to our our startups that uh, have had some success at Focus Right Europe. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Noam Shapiro, the co CEO of Setu, and uh, Anna. Uh, Benisevic, uh, co-founder and CEO of Zizu. Good morning, Pete. Uh, welcome, Noah. Anna? Hello. Good morning. So, just a quick intro. Uh, Setu was the winner last year at Focus Right Europe's Battleground event um, as the EMEA Travel Innovator of the Year. And Zizu was the People's Choice winner at our launch competition, which is for companies that are that are older than five years who are launching new uh, new products or product extensions. So uh, just a little bit about these two companies. Setu is an insurance as a service platform that allows travel sellers to deliver tailor, uh, tailored insurance products to travelers in a seamless, uh, delightful manner. I think Noah likes to, uh, Noam likes to, uh, to, to state it that way. Uh, and Zizu is a, a software as a service boat holiday platform as well as distribution business that offers, I think Anna, now you're up to over 35,000 boats that you've uh, aggregated on, on your, your platform. So uh, congratulations on, on that growth. Uh, from a funding perspective, just to put things into perspective, uh, I think both of your businesses uh, last raised in the fall of, of 2018, and both of you have raised, raised roughly eight to, to 10 million. Uh, dollars uh, or, or, you know, euros, I suppose, as well. So uh, maybe, Anna, I'll start with you. Um, as we think back to Focus Right Europe, uh, and I know it probably seems like a decade ago, uh, last year in May, you had just launched a, a GDS platform for boat rentals, and you had also discussed growth plans uh, as far as kind of expansion to the U.S. market, as well as you saw an opportunity to scale uh, your boat, you know, the, the folks that use your platform, those boat owners, um, you know, the importance of scale to get them to kind of use and adopt some of your, your features. So I've, I've noticed that you've, you've, you've done a really good job of scaling, um, you know, boat owners that are using your platform. As far as geographic expansion, has that been slowed a little bit uh, during this time? And can you kind of bring us up to speed on, on where you are with with really both of those initiatives? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the very nice introduction. So um, we obviously had strong impact from COVID for two months, but um, what we did in this time is just shift our business to service domestic markets. So actually right now, our three biggest markets are US customers going to the US, German customers going to Germany, and Italians going to Italy. So in terms of re the geographic focus, not too much has changed because these were also previously our key source markets. It's just that now these travelers are traveling locally. Okay, yes, and we, we certainly see that as a trend in our research as well, that that kind of local travel is the first to kind of recover, and then we'll start looking at, at more international um, you know, travel as, 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 we, uh, as we recover deeper. Uh, Noam, as you, you know, your take on insurance is, is really twofold. So can you tell the audience, um, you know, how you kind of lead with customization of, of your, you know, insurance add-ons to, to offer personalization for your customers and then what you're doing to automate the, the claims process. Um, and then, you know, where's your focus been over the last uh, three to four months? Sure, Peter, and thank you for the introduction. 
Maybe just uh, starting with, you said uh, we are building a platform that allows online travel agents to build personalized insurance, delightful insurance. That's exactly true. But that's actually not only limited to travel players. We actually provide, the platform was built in order to provide multiple types of online businesses to build this type of insurance product. What we did is basically we built a platform that automates uh, the full life cycle of insurance from a uh, pricing proposal, et cetera, up to uh, the claim process. Well, when, when talking about automated claim process, we are talking about what is called the parametric insurance where we are able to get information about the event that is causing the pain to the consumers from an external data a source. And uh, indeed, as you mentioned, we started uh, very strongly in travel. We unfortunately, I'm saying it right now because of the COVID, of course, we started very strongly with online travel agents. Uh, which has got uh, uh, quite a hard hit uh, in the last few months. Needless to say, people are hardly flying these days, uh, which is actually also imposing on the fact that they are not selling insurance either because they are not flying. Uh, at the same time, what, uh, what is happening, is, and it's quite interesting, is that these players uh, that are selling the online travel agents, those that are still with their head on top of the water, that still have an a, a appetite to invest in the future, they do realize that when travel will come back, and it will gradually come back, maybe not in 2020, maybe more towards 2021, uh, full steam uh, later on, people have a, a very high appetite for a, a insurance. And that's where we come into place, and this is, a, a, in a sense, a, something very interesting about what's going on right now. In the last two months that you asked about, while we revenues were dramatically decreased, we are actually never then before busy because we are working with customers in order to facilitate that. There are uh, expansion in the future. This is including our existing customers that are building more and enhancing their services with us and actually closing new contacts with new customers. Another thing that happened in the last two months is that we've seen that indeed domestic, like you just mentioned, is coming back much faster. And therefore, uh, uh, we have been investing a bit more with domestic travel type of players in order to provide products that are more relevant for domestic, many times around weather, around accommodation, and so on. Uh, and another thing that we've been doing the last two months is, as I mentioned, we're not travel only. We've started looking in other verticals. Our platform is built for many verticals. The go-to market was travel. However, right now we are starting to expedite a bit in order to go to other verticals in order to uh, deal with a situation where travel takes a bit longer to recover in this sense. So I, I think we've heard a theme here uh, as, of companies, um, again, trying to avoid that, that word pivoting, but looking at other opportunities maybe outside of travel. Anna, I, I, I'd say you're not so fortunate. Uh, your, your business is pretty entrenched in the travel industry. Um, and and I'd, I'm interested to hear, you know, as you kind of, you know, have gone through the last three, four months, uh, you know, we've, we've heard, uh, you, you know, you're kind of presented with a trade-off between hibernating to some degree uh, or, or innovating and hibernating, you know, shrinking your burn rate, really making sure that you have enough uh, cash reserves to make it through um, and, and, you know, an unknown period of time. So can you tell us how you're balancing, uh, you know, that kind of, I suppose, dichotomy between hibernating and innovating? Yes, absolutely. I mean, just like Noam, we've been very busy, actually. And I have to say that when Corona hit us, like end of February, March, that's when our revenue started to drop. But I have to say, personally, I knew on the first day that I realized this is really going to happen, that it's going to be beneficial to our company. And I know that sounds <laughs> overly optimistic, but it actually has been. So we had to really change our business within seven days, right? Take radical action, as you said, obviously to cut costs. We reduced the burn rate by 50%. Our investors were very nervous and we needed to make sure that they, they calm down and we show them that we can be financially disciplined. As mentioned also, we obviously shifted our entire team to change conditions so we can still attract customers to focus on ramping up in domestic markets. What we also did is really focus on PR and content and start to raise awareness for boat holidays 
being the safest option for, for travel this year. And I think why we see this as beneficial to our business is it's, it's actually pretty amazing to have two months break from crazy growth targets. And I don't know if other startups feel this way, but for us, it was a relief to be able to think strategically and put much more focus on our product, on rolling out our SaaS tool and on um, developing more automation in the business. And now, actually, in this month, our, our business has fully recovered. So we're actually seeing year-on-year -year growth. Um, there's so much demand in domestic markets that it's, it's partially unserviceable. So I think that our, our um, hypothesis that boat holidays will be the safest place to do a holiday this summer has, has become true. And we're really taking advantage of that right now. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think pent up demand is something that we've seen um, in a lot of, of different categories across the industry. Um, as far as kind of, you know, your B2B to C business and, and Noah, maybe on your side, as you're talking to potential travel distribution companies, are, are those conversations um, difficult to come by as those companies are really struggling and focusing on their core competence, competency? Or do you find that there's, you know, more fruitful conversations as they're looking for more ways to kind of diversify their, their revenue? And maybe Noah, Noah, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I think it's not, a, it's not always the same. There are customers like that and customers like that. Some of the customers actually reduced cost quite dramatically and, you know, invest only in making the operation work. And don't really invest in the future that much and we have a few like this some of them really dropped in terms of uh, you know order a uh, book things for a, a few percentage uh, uh, below five percent and so on some of them that i guess are a bit more stronger are looking into in, into the future and they they do see the opportunity that there is in the end okay they do realize that some of the players that are playing today are not necessarily going to survive the, that end some of them, uh, uh, these guys are practically investing in improving their uh, ability to monetize on that day, thinking about what's going to work. They are talking very much about the fact that there's going to be an amazing appetite for insurance specifically because of all the things that just happened. And therefore, uh, uh, we see some that are investing quite dramatically with us. And again, <laughs> I'm saying it uh, smiling, but we have, nev uh, we have never worked harder than the this period uh, uh, in life. Um, so, so in general, yeah, we do see some that are going under, some of them are going on top. And uh, so uh, the domestic guys, are, as mentioned before, are working probably even harder than those that are more focused on the international flights, etc. And Anna, how about you as far as your kind of GDS strategy and, and kind of tapping into distribution? Are you having fruitful conversations with agencies and, and uh, you know, others that are interested in, in using your, your distribution technology? Absolutely. I think that this is, again, maybe a benefit that we're seeing through this crisis is the fact that there's a real pressure on the market. And of course, one of Zizu's main goals is to improve the conditions in the market. So the boat holiday market is very old school and uh, the operators are very traditional. But because of this situation right now, they've started to be a lot more flexible. And so we've managed to push conditions into the market that we haven't for two years and we've been begging for. So more friendly um, cancellation, better, more flexible booking terms, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, on, this, on the GDS side also, and on, this, uh, on our SaaS, we can see that the engagement has gone up a lot during this period. So actually um, our suppliers are seeing the benefit of engaging with our tool on a daily basis. But I think we've really tried to support our suppliers through this crisis, because obviously there are many of them are small businesses, they're very stressed out. And I think one of the number one priorities of Zizu has been to help them not go bankrupt because of course there's a big exposure on on bookings that were supposed to happen and perhaps couldn't and so number one priority was to reschedule bookings rather than have them be cancelled so we actually managed to reschedule 90 percent of all bookings that couldn't happen and i think that helped a lot that's great so maybe 
30 seconds from each of you. Um, can you give kind of one, share one learning with the startups that have joined us today about, you know, what you've done in your business. It doesn't even need to be business related. It can be personal, you know, personal related as well. So Noah, maybe I'll start with you to, uh, to give one lesson learned to our, uh, our audience today. One lesson. Um, I, I think it was mentioned earlier. I think the, uh, the crisis is also an opportunity needless to say. You just need to be smart in the way that you manage your cash and your expectations of cash. And if you're smart enough, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for going out from this uh, crisis. Anna, how about you? I would agree with Noam, um, but I would say for us, it's been to be fast and radical. So both on cost cutting measure, on changing conditions. And in the end, I think it's an opportunity, a uh, crisis is an opportunity but it's also an opportunity to emerge as a leader. And we've really tried to stand out as an authority and leader to both our customers and our suppliers. And I think that's gonna make us the leader in the long term. Never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So thank you very much, Noam Shapira and Anna Benisevich. Uh, so these have been uh, our, uh, our, our winners from, from Focus Right Europe from last year. Um, next up, I'm gonna, I'm going to shift gears uh, to a, a couple of winners from our, our annual global event. Um, so, Gene, if you can shift to uh, uh, the Focus Right Conference winners. Uh, it's my, my pleasure here. I see Dennis is on. Um, Mia will be on shortly. Uh, Dennis uh, Vilovich, uh, the founder of, of Troop Travel, and, and Mia Thompson, director of partnership at Air, Air Allo. Uh, Pleasure to have both of you on. Good to see you guys again. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just give a quick intro on, on your, your businesses so we can dive in here. So, so Troop Travel, um, early stage startup, uh, aggregates thousands of data points, enabling corporate travel managers and meeting planners to select uh, event destinations based on uh, objective intelligence rather than just uh, opinions. And uh, uh, Eralo is the first uh, eSIM store for travelers. So Eralo provides travelers access in over a hundred companies, hundred countries, I think is, uh, Anna can update us on that, uh, to local roaming rates without having to carry multiple SIM cards or uh, change phone numbers. Uh, so Dennis, maybe I'll, uh, I'll start with you and Mia, if you can mute your line, uh, I'll come to you here in a, in a little bit. Uh, Dennis, so the Focus Wire team caught up with you last month, and you've been doing some interesting things. And you know, the 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 data that you're using has maybe shifted a little bit with your customers, um, you know, during this pandemic. So can you kind of bring our audience up to speed on on maybe some of the trends that you've been seeing over the last uh, last uh, three to four months? Yeah, thanks, Pete, for first of all for having us here today. Um, it has been an interesting ride over the last couple of months, actually. And um, whenever I've been asked now recently, uh, like, explaining a bit what we are doing, then I always start with, uh, with basically saying, like, why the heck would you want to listen currently to startup pitching and meetings and events, knowing that no meetings and events are happening, basically? And then, well, maybe because you're interested to understand how is it possible that we actually tripled our our customer base of Fortune 500 customers. So I think that's uh, in essence, basically what has happened. We've seen massive uh, growth uh, on our side, ma massive interest uh, in what we are doing and really, um, well, trying to answer this question of, of where do we meet? This, it, it, I mean, it's a very basic question when you organize meetings and events, but it's, it's actually now more difficult than ever to, to figure that out. And what we've seen now coming to the trends basically related to COVID-19, I mean, the, the travel restrictions coming in, uh, I mean, it's, it's already very difficult currently to know, let's say, where can you travel to if you come from the US? Now, if you have a group of people coming from a couple of origins, well, I mean, then it's really, really difficult to bring these things together. So that, that's one of the things, the hybrid meetings, I think another very, very interesting trend. So really, I, I think, um, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trends happening here, a lot of changes happening, but uh, so far it has been very, very promising for us. Yeah, I, I, as, as the, the, the world has changed and remote work has obviously been forced upon uh, many of us, it would seem that your technology would actually 
you know, benefit in some ways because, um, you know, a lot of these businesses need to get their executive teams together to do some strategic planning. Um, so are you starting to hear that from them? And of course, they have to deal with travel restrictions um, at this point, but how is that kind of impacting your business? I think um, we see, I mean, again, really a, a lot of interest of being able to answer this question and not only bring the executive together, but actually really, um, I mean, people know meetings will come back. There's will be potentially less. It will take time until we hit this, this number of 2019, but in-person meetings are, I mean, they will still be there. I mean, I would prefer to sit with you now somewhere in an office than having here the screen basically separating us. So companies have realized that and what they've seen or what we've seen now that actually they utilize this time right now to bring in new technologies, new strategies, because nothing else is happening there anyway. So that is really why I mean, the, the innovators are, are going for us now and there are other companies who are still, let's say, waiting and which we are expecting to then capture potentially in September or, or later end of the year when things are potentially a bit better. Great. So Mia, shifting to you, um, you can unmute at this point. Uh, so your business is focused on international travel, which is probably going to be the slowest to return. I think we're seeing domestic return and that international piece will be slowest. Can you give us an update on how your conversations are going with potential partners? Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, we are focused on international travel, uh, but we've also seen a shift, like previous speakers have said, that we work together with the operators to create a new revenue channel for the incoming travelers, but we all also work on the local markets, uh, which is good. So we are seeing, you know, uh, some reports coming in from all the partners that we have in with, you know, different reports on when travel is going to pick up internationally. And I think it's a good time as well, looking at partnerships with the amount of partnerships that we've closed in a very short amount of time is that now it's a good time to connect with the partners, to onboard them, to do that, all the integration. So when the uh, travel actually starts to pick up, everything is ready to go for them. So for us, you know, that, that's been working out uh, quite all right, actually. Great. So as, as we talked in the, the last group, we talked about kind of that hibernate or, or innovate dilemma. So I think as far as total funding goes, uh, Eralo has raised slightly less than $2 million. Uh, Dennis, you have, you've raised somewhere in the, you know, three to $400,000 range. Um, so cash is tight. Uh, can you tell us, you know, how you're kind of skewing on that spectrum? Are you, are you kind of lean and mean? Are you focused on, on just making it through? Or are you really pushing forward innovation? Mia, maybe I'll start with you. Absolutely. So I think a lot in this comes down to planning and prioritization. Uh, and that's something that we've been very, very strict with. But in saying that as well, and as a good news to, to other startups out there, it's totally possible to raise money even in times like these. So we've just closed the funding round and more information about that is to come. But there are good news out there. And with the money that you're getting in, it's very important that you know prioritize how to use them. You do a lot of planning. And it also comes down to like developing and perfecting the service that you have today. So that's something that we're really not down to do to create the perfect customer journeys. We can provide the best experience when travel picks up. And Dennis, how about you? Yeah, I'm actually happy to hear me that uh, you've raised some funding. Congratulations <laughs> on that. And uh, that's actually very, very exciting because, um, I mean, we are open to receive investment. The good thing is, well, we actually, we have a runway of 12 months currently. So we would like to uh, well, uh, raise investments in order to support the growth we are seeing right now. But we have always been very, very uh, lean in the way we operate. We were three people in January. Now we are eight. So in that respect, I think... Um, uh, we are fine, and, uh, but definitely we would like to, to see the opportunity to, to push now, utilize this time, this opportunity right now to, to grow faster. So as far as kind of raising money, Dennis, um, I, I believe you've, you've uh, raised uh, through government grants fairly recently. Um, are you looking kind of, what sort of funding as, as we're going through this time, as, as, as uh, Chris and, and Ben uh, spoke about, and I think this is, commonly uh, understood across the industry is that it's, we've kind of shifted from a, you know, from a seller's market to a buyer's market on the funding side. Um, so are, has that kind of changed your strategy as you're kind of out thinking about raising money, kind of where, where's your head at from that perspective? 
Yeah, I think our strategy has um, changed a bit and we, we just, well, we, we had a bridge round actually mid of last year and we received some, 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 some VC money in December. So just before the crisis started, I think that was, that was great. So actually we have raised today maybe $700,000. So still, I mean, not much in the end. But then um, the plan was to grow the company to 30 customers so that we hit a million on ARR uh, and then by end of the year, basically, and then do a seed round. But now um, basically what we've decided to reopen the bridge round just to get a bit more cash in to really to add more to the team in order to, as I said earlier, to, to utilize the situation a bit, a bit more. So in that respect, it has changed uh, slightly. Mia, as far as kind of strategy goes, um, has your strategy changed? Um, you know, have you kind of looked at other opportunities during during this pandemic time? You mentioned that you're certainly servicing local, uh, which obviously is, is is important. So you can can you kind of walk us through through that? How the pandemic has kind of you know forced you to maybe shift strategies slightly? Absolutely. So I think. In, in, in all through this pandemic and how we are thinking, because every startup is filled with passion. And as passion, you have like a goal with what do you want to achieve with your startup? And we want to assist travelers. So I think, you know, and, and just as a side note, all, all companies out there should think right now, how can we assist, you know, both our partners with providing them with, you know, the right solutions and support, but also the actual travelers out there. How can we help them and support them? So we've done, you know, uh, promotions where we shared free connectivity to seafarers and, and people out there. And, and that for us has been the focus to kind of keep the traveler in focus, even though through this pandemic. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely shifted with us focusing on, on, on the local markets, working also with the operators to see how can we assist them to acquire a market share on the local market and not just on the incoming travelers. We've done a lot of strategizing within the team to see how can we work more efficient. Uh, so a lot of that's been going, going on behind the scenes and we'll keep going on as well. Great. Uh, so we're kind of, uh, the, these sessions go really quickly here. Um, so as, as, as you think about kind of your experiences over the last three to four months, uh, Dennis, maybe I'll shift it over to you. What sort of lessons have you learned and what can you share maybe that one kind of big learning that you can share uh, with the audience here today yeah i think um i mean on the visa side the lessons i think has been mentioned already uh, many times really utilizing the opportunity crisis as opportunity but so let me share one on the, on the personal side so um, i mean i am in my normal office i we are virtual so this is my office i'm at home so the difference has been now that i have my three kids you're just like running around all the time and I thought it would be actually, I mean, don't get me wrong, but it would be actually not the nicest to have when you're trying to work. Uh, but actually it has been extremely nice having the family really for two months, we were locked in at home for two months, really so close together. So uh, I think that's uh, my personal uh, lessons learned there, so to say, that's actually really, really great. Have the kids uh, so many hours around you, so. Mia, how about you? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because during the dry run of this show, my son actually barged in uh, and, and took the spotlight. But I think the lessons that I've, I've learned personally is both when it comes to planning and prioritizing, but also when it comes to passion. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, startups are coping with passion, we're built upon passion. So it's really important that we keep this passion through these difficult times because there are so many companies out there that are currently struggling. So... I think if you can keep that passion and keep that motivation within the team while playing it very smart, I think that is, is a winning strategy. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks for those uh, words of words of wisdom. So <laughs> appreciate having Dennis and, and Mia join us uh, here today. So um, congratulations on kind of making it this far and best of luck here as we move, uh, hopefully uh, in the, the, the relative near term into that kind of first, second phases of recovery and international travels not, not too far away. So um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, so now we're going to, uh, to, to transition back uh, and, and listen to um, some more investors uh, talk about kind of what they're seeing in the market. So we're shifting back to Asia and it's my pleasure to, uh, to bring on Su Hoon, the uh, founder of WIT, who is going to lead us through uh, the Lens of Investors, part two. So, 
Su Hoon, take us, uh, take us through this, uh, this last session here. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And good evening from Singapore. Well, you know, this crisis is certainly demanding that we respond with courage. And, uh, you know, in the last hour, you've heard from two very courageous investors and six very brave startups, including two from Asia that we're really proud of at WIT. Uh, Split was the startup of the year in 2018. And I have seen Dylan grow up and he's fighting the brawl of his life and he's making it through, very proud of him. And Akemi, um, so quick to respond to a very, very urgent and real need for COVID-19 information. So fantastic, very proud of Akemi as well. And now I have the pleasure to interview two courageous investors, Melissa Gazi from uh, Arbor Ventures, who is actually in Singapore, but now is in Maine, and Fritz Demopoulos, who's the CEO of Queens Road Capital, who's based in Hong Kong. Hello, Melissa and Fritz, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me. As you can tell, I'm not in Singapore dressed with pretty warm clothes sitting up here on a cold day in Maine. Well, it looks more beautiful where you are right now from where, where I'm sitting. So, Fritz, how are you, Fritz? How's Hong Kong? Hong Kong's great. I'm just very happy to be here. Fantastic. Okay. So, we, we you know, I'm going to take a different road today, and, and I'm just going to be guided by old-fashioned tools because this, this strange times has sort of made me want to cling to nostalgia. So, I'm going to use pen and paper, all right? And I'm just going to go through, I'm going to have our journey guided by Confucius. I'm going to throw a quote at you, each of you, and then you respond, all right? So the first quotation from Confucius is, wherever you go, go with all your heart. So Melissa, where is your heart, gut, or wallet telling you to go right now? Well, I, I think the first thing we did is to make sure that our entrepreneurs knew uh, when this all begun that we were going to stand by them and work very closely with them to get themselves on the right path. Uh, fortunately, we had, you know, seen this uh, a significant downturn in 2001, which, you know, we, I had lived through as a venture capitalist, as an entrepreneur. And I, and I think that paid off. Um, fortunately, because I live in Asia, you know, we, we saw the first wave of it and we were able to take that knowledge and work pretty closely with the portfolio. But I think standing by the portfolio companies and the entrepreneurs very early on to work closely with them was uh, absolutely the right thing to do. And it's, it's really paid off on multiple fronts. I think our relationship is closer. I think the companies are uh, in pretty good shape, but I think you right. have to stick to your gut in, in tough times. You dig deeper, yeah. you work harder, you stand by yeah. your entrepreneurs and you, you think about what the future is going to look like. Cause when we do come out of this, we'll be in a new norm but we'll yeah. also hopefully be in a better world. Yeah, fantastic, Melissa. So standing by your entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and the people you believe in, and for Fritz though, you know, other than standing by, where is your heart, gut, and wallet telling you to go right now? Well, I guess, Suhun, how, how I think about it is, you know, I, I, I mean, sometimes there's an overemphasis on heart and an underemphasis on strategy and process. And how I think about it is, you know, we have to think about strategy. And what I mean by that is how do we think the, 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 the result of, of this virus, you know, how is the market going to change? And we need to be very thoughtful about that. And we need to work with our entrepreneurs on um, who we think the winners are going to be, how, you know, how the market will change, what our advantages might be um, after we um, come out of this. It's almost like Mark Twain said, right? Like, I, I, I think he would hold his breath and go under the Atlantic and come out on the other side. I forgot what the, what the quote was about German or something like that. But anyways, it, it's about, um, you know, we're, we're, we're entering some unknown areas. However, you know, uh, from a strategic perspective, I think we can think about that a lot. Um, and then secondly, process. And, and you know, and, and, and to me, process is, is all about discipline, to be honest. And we need to make sure that all of our companies are extremely disciplined in how we think about our business, whether it's a little bit of a retrenchment or optimization or thinking about our plans a little bit more carefully. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, Suhoon, like you talked about, you know, like you brought up the paper cards and talked about, you know, uh, let's go up back in history a little bit. And what's interesting is, you know, when I first became an entrepreneur in the uh, late 90s, so I'm kind of dating myself, there was this rule of thumb, which was always have two years of cash in the bank. 
always be extremely disciplined about that. And I think maybe some companies forgot about that in these boom periods we've been having where there's too much money and, you know, the vision fund is giving a check to everybody and money's flowing from the Chinese yeah, yeah. and Americans and all that sort of stuff. So, but, the, so the old fashioned but, principle of having cash. Yeah. And, you know, today. yeah. Yeah. And, and frankly, there's some companies that weren't very sexy, but you know, that I've, luckily I've been involved with some of those and they were extremely disciplined about let's make sure we always have two years of cash in the bank and they're just, yeah. you know, doing great right now. And they have the, um, you know, and, and, and they can expend some creativity and really think about how the industry mm-hmm. is going to evolve and seek out those. I mean, everyone's been talking about, oh, you know, you know, every time there's a crisis, there's an opportunity. I, I, in fact, I think there's a Chinese saying on that, right? And yeah, there, there, there is. So wait, wait, yeah. Fritz, I'm going to go to the next one because th- then we talk about the companies that have really risen to the challenge, right? Because another of Confucius quotes is, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So Melissa, if you could give one example of one of your portfolio companies that has risen to the challenge of COVID. Well, I hate to favor anyone in particular because I think we actually have five or six who, um, you know, have have really risen. But I, I think um, actually we've we've got five companies, I, and I won't pick on any particular one though, but hit profitability during COVID. And I think you know, as Fritz said, it's it's not about just well. It, he didn't say this specifically, but it's not about just buckling down and, and making sure you have two, two years of cash. And I completely agree with Fritz. It's two years of cash. It's not nine months. It's not 12. It's two years. But it's also companies that were able to change their approach to adapt to the pressures of COVID. And let me take enterprise sales as a perfect example, which is how do you sell an enterprise software product to someone who's sitting at home with kid, two kids running around and a dog barking, Right. That's not easy. And so the idea of being able to make adjustments and, and, and make it, you know, rapid, be able to deploy remotely, be able to do the pre-sales, be able to modify the product that, you know, you could, you could actually still function in, in this, you know, very unique environment that we're in. Those are the companies that have risen. And I think also the companies that really, you know, cut their burn rates for relatively early, focused on unit economics, have really been looking at their KPIs on a daily basis and thinking about how to change their product for the market environment we're in now, but also how they're going to develop the product for the future. And, you know, as I said, you know, fortunately, we too did not have what you would call the sexiest B2C portfolio. We're 90% B2B, mostly around digital infrastructure, related to financial services. But interestingly enough, those so-called non-sexy companies are now reaching, you know, have all of a sudden, you know, some of them, as I said, five or six have reached profitability and have seen, you know, pretty significant growth during this period. So I can't favor one, but, you know, I'll just mention the companies that have really acted remarkably, which is TrueMid, which is cross-border trading platform, Forder, underwriting chargeback risk for fraud, Ever compliant, doing marketplace fraud identification, um, true, uh, ever, uh, true Accord, which is digitizing debt collection. Uh, you know, these are companies that have had, and 2C to P, which remarkably was impacted by the travel business because we process payments for 18 of 20 airlines in Southeast Asia and remarkably beat their Q1 forecast with new business. Okay, so it's the, the unsexy companies that kind of rose to the challenge. So Fritz, yeah. can you give me an example? I'm sorry, we have 20 minutes. Yeah. I have to rush through. Uh, yeah. Fritz, can you give me an example of one, one of your portfolio companies that has risen to the challenge? Yeah, you, you, know, like, um, you know, like Melissa said, um, like we never <laughs> want to favor one child over another, right? I know, but you're, but you're not allowed to pick five. Right, right. <laughs> we so, don't have the time. Um, I, I, I think the one thing that I'll say, and, you know, Kevin May and I were, were exchanging emails on this actually is, you know, when, when things are booming, you have to build the plane and fly it at the same time. And now we're in a period where maybe we can just build the plane. We don't have to fly it, right, because the market's so soft. And so I think the absolute best companies are like, hey, we still have a product vision. 
and we're building that. Yes, we don't have enough data points, uh, obviously, because we don't have the transactions to do all the A-B testing stuff and, and some of the optimization, but there's still some big leaps we can make. And, you know, there's, and, and so it's obviously there's one company that um, luckily is cash rich, but they're not just sitting around and laughing. You know, they're continuing to focus on, you know, building that airplane so that when, so when we have uh, clear skies again, you know, they can fly without having, you know, to scramble to build it and fly it at the same time. And, you know, that means really focusing on product and engineering um, and making sure that, and, and, and of course, um, we did make some bets. Uh, so one bet we made, and, you know, this is very, very difficult for entrepreneurs is, you know, do we cut back our staff or do we think, hey, you know what, things are going to come back maybe sooner than we think. And so why should we go through the process of, you know, getting rid of a, a bunch of people and then hire them back. And so it's, 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 it's kind of one of the hard decisions you have to make. And, and, and this is a very, very specific example, right? Like you're sitting here, you know, the market's horrible. Do you kind of retrench to have a more a sustainable level? Or do you say, you know what, I want to keep these amazing people, put them to work. We still have a vision. Yes. We're taking a little bit of risk, but it, but of course, if we time it just right, it's going to be great for the business. Okay, excellent. So, you know, but this, this crisis is also making, you know, a lot of people think about what they do, right? So another of Confucius uh, quotes is, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. But actually, is there ever a good time to stop? I mean, at what point does a startup or a company say, okay, you know, maybe this thing is really crushing us now? you know, we should stop. Melissa. Well, I don't think, uh, I don't think stopping, I don't think about it as purely just stopping. I think about it as, you know, entrepreneurs may choose to pivot. I mean, I do think that in some regards, COVID is, has been liberating to get off the treadmill and, and have time to think about strategically what you're doing, both on personal levels and on a business level. But I, I think, you know, I wouldn't call that stopping. I would, I would say that's yeah. maybe changing directions and pivoting. I mean, taking a that, detour. Taking yeah. a detour. Taking okay, a Fritz. Detour. Yeah. But I think those that stop are just giving up. I mean, there's no need to give right. up. If you have capital in the bank, there's, there's an opportunity to step back, get off the treadmill and, and think strategically. All right. Fritz, is there you ever a time my... to give up? Yeah, maybe, you know, I mean, to me, this is one of the most difficult decisions an entrepreneur has to make, right? Do you pivot? Maybe. Um, you're right. I think Marissa talked about this a little bit earlier. I, th I, th I, th I think too many, uh, I think it I think has a bad rap, right? I think too many founders do that. You know, when the, when the going gets tough, they pivot, right? <laughs> you know, you know, uh, they don't try to solve the problems in front of them. Um, but at the same time, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe it wasn't the right opportunity. Maybe, maybe it's not the right skill set. It's, 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 it's really like a difficult, you know, uh, you know, decision. The thing is, I, I mean, you know, my advice to any entrepreneur is, you know, you know, don't make that decision lightly to give up. Um, normally you have to have a lot of faith and belief in, 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 in your vision and you may not have all the data points. And this is where you really have to rack your brains and say, you know what, I, you know, just something tells me I have to keep going. Right. right. And so it's, it's, it's this, you know, this maverick foolish vision, but at the same time, you know, what's holding you back a little bit is may, maybe, you know, a little bit of rationality and then somehow hopefully you can make the right decision. Um, um, you okay. know, we've seen so, entrepreneurs. Yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So, Sorry, you know, I have, we have six minutes left, okay? And so we want to get through another two quotes. So another one of his most famous one is, never do to others what you would not like them to do to you. So one thing that investors should not do to startups now, Fritz. So, you know, there's a suggestion that um, in, in investors dis maybe display bad behavior or maybe excesses. And how I would think about it is, you know, you have investors, founders, employees, and service providers or during boom times uh, display certain levels of excess. And sometimes, um, you know, there's some good behavior as well. And, you know, and, and for example, you know, when things were doing great, investors thought they were geniuses because they invested in 10 companies and nine were, you know, like 
you know, prop or it, it, at least on paper evaluations had increases, right? Founders thought they were geniuses, right? Oh, other people who have 50 years of experience don't get it. And like, I'm a founder and I have this vision. I'm, I, I must have this magic touch that, you know, that, you know, that nobody else has, right? Employees became, you know, mercenaries where you had to pay them a lot of money, you know, and, 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 and kind of stuff like that. And then service providers also were just overcharging. You know, th th this is in periods that are just like, you know, in, in, in these boom periods as we saw, and now things are very, very difficult. And all of a sudden we're asking ourselves, you know what, maybe not everyone was as smart as we thought they were. And, 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 so, and so I think specifically to answer your question, you know, investors, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, like, are we in a position to judge these companies? You know, uh, were we part of that excess that maybe led to some of the challenges these companies are facing today? Um, okay. And so it, it means being a bit humble. It means being, you know, a little bit self-reflective and, mm -hmm. and hopefully be part of the solution. Okay, so let me ask uh, Melissa the flip question, which is, which is what should startups not do to investors right now? Uh, they, need to have a, they need to have transparency and they need to think about their uh, investors as partners. Um, but I think lack of transparency drives people insane during periods like this. And so if I was a founder, I'd make sure I have given my investors a lot of transparency uh, and, and I would be very, I would probably err on the side of too much communication at the moment, but I, I would say, and to get ahead of issues, like rather than letting them boil up, because I think when people do that, it's really appreciated and you can build a much better relationship with your, with your investors. Okay. The next uh, quote, we have three minutes. Everything has its beauty, but not everyone sees it. And actually, if you look at the coronavirus, you know, it's actually quite beautiful, right? It's got all this, it looks, it looks really beautiful. So what is the silver lining to this crisis, uh, Melissa? Very quickly, what is the silver lining? Uh, well, I, I think the silver lining, uh, there's two silver linings. One, I think from a selfish perspective, as Fritz has said, there was so much noise, so much froth in the market. You know, you were seeing these crazy rounds. I think this really just separates uh, companies that are really going to be uh, surviving new entities versus a lot of froth. I mean, to me, this is like, thankfully, this has finally happened because it was getting crazy valuations were nuts. So I think that's a silver lining. We needed this to happen. Um, right. and, and I think personally, you know, this is probably the first time in 15 years I haven't been jet lagged for three months. So I, I'm sort of enjoying that. <laughs> Me, <as too>. well. <laughs> Me too. Oh my God, I'm sleeping so well. Fritz, what is the silver lining? I guess how I think about it is, you know, maybe there's a greater appreciation for those frontline workers. What I mean by that is whether it's the reception and front desk staff at hotels, baristas, Uber drivers, gig economy people, retail yeah. workers. Frankly, this crisis has shown us, I mean, all of us can sit at home and be on our Zoom conference calls and talk about, you know, all the cool travel places we want to go. But frankly, there's a large portion of the population that don't have the luxury maybe to travel the way we travel and kind of yeah. to kind of enjoy, you know, all the cool experiences and all the cool stuff that, that we all try to one up each other on every time we go to a conference. Right. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, I, yeah, you know, I heard appreciate a, those people. Yeah. Fritz, you know, I heard a song on Spotify today. It came out on my release radar and it was a thank you song to, you know, the food delivery people, to the health workers, you know, and it's on, on the Spotify list right now. So, all right. Yeah, so the know, final. Those, yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> frankly, you, you know, like those people make the least amount of money. They don't travel. Society views them as a, you know, like a lower social class. And only now do we realize, oh my gosh, we need these people. Right. All right. So well, what, actually, sorry. Yeah. can I just add to that? Cause I yeah. think it's really an important point. Like as Fritz said, they're not sitting home complaining. They're actually working. They're taking the risk. And I mean, I think, you know, they really are heroes and heroines to, to all of this. And it goes to show you that the, you know, the, the idea that the grit and perseverance should really be applauded on so many Ab fronts. Absolutely. Absolutely. So last question is, you know, a lot of people have been baking at home or, you know, doing learning, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever new skills. So Confucius says, I hear and forget. I see and remember. I do and understand. 
So what have you done during this lockdown that has made you understand one aspect of what you do better? What have you done during this lockdown other than baking or cooking? Fritz? <laughs> Fritz, okay, Fritz. Uh, I mean, I, I think I'm a better uh, golfer, to be honest. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I envy that you can still play golf. Okay, Melissa, to you. Uh, I hate to admit it, but I pretty much do the same thing I normally do. I work, I run, I eat, I sleep. Uh, <laughs> but you sleep better now, Melissa. You I sleep, sleep better, better now. I, I have taken two classes online. All right. I mean, uh, okay. Thank you. We're out of time. Thank time, you very much to Fritz the, and Melissa. The reality is... I haven't... Sorry, there, there was a bit okay. of a lag. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you, Melissa. Enjoy. Okay. So, uh, Kevin, are you coming back on? And Pete and Marissa to yes. say thank you to our audience. There you go. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Suhoon, for a great session. So uh, from the top, we'd just like to say thank you, obviously, to uh, Chris and Ben, Dylan and Akemi, Noam and Anna. Uh, Dennis, Amir, Melissa, and Fritz, who you just heard from. Right, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, obviously, startups, entrepreneurs that are tuning in today, uh, for those that you don't know, uh, Focusrite has been producing the State of Startups report for over 10 years now. Uh, and everything to do with that, uh, you can get by emailing info at focusrite.com or finding out for more information at focusrite.com. Um, Pete and I uh, recently hosted a what we call our Fast Facts webinars, uh, where Pete went through a lot of the details of uh, how startups have been coping with this particular uh, outbreak of the COVID-19 over the last four or five months. That's all on uh, focuswire.com, so you can check that out. Um, for those of you that don't know, How I Got Here is a podcast that Focuswire and Mozio launched last September. Uh, we did season one of that, and that's basically an interview with entrepreneurs and innovators in travel and transportation. Uh, Fritz, who you just heard for, was one of our guests uh, in the middle, uh, the back end of last year. So we did 28 episodes. And uh, breaking news, season two of How I Got Here is starting next week with another well-known name who's always got a, a, an opinion or two. That's Rob Cuthbert. So uh, he kicks off season two. We've already recorded about uh, 10 of our episodes already. So look out for that next week. Right. Important dates for your diary. So uh, next week, uh, uh, sorry, two weeks time, the 24th of June. Uh, Sue Hoon and her gang and us, there's quite a few of us involved again, called the Round the World. Uh, what we're doing is uh, a series of interviews uh, starting off in Asia. Then we come to Europe, which I'm going to do, and then we go to the, the, the US. So uh, details about that are at witevents.com. Is that correct, Sue Hoon? Thank you, Kevin. Yes, we look okay. forward to taking everybody around the world with us on June 24th. Okay. Uh, a mere day later, June the 25th, is uh, Focusrite Battleground. That's uh, going to be online. Aha, and here we have a handy slide. Sorry, we didn't have a, a slide for the Round the World one, but it's easy to find on witevents.com. But here you go. So June the 25th, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can register for free for that. That's uh, ba uh, focusrightbattleground.com. So uh, you can uh, uh, do that. That's the kind of the prelude to our big event that happens in November this year, which will be on the uh, 16th to the 19th of November in Arizona. Uh, Focus Right Europe, last bit of housekeeping here, unless uh, I've, I've forgotten anything, Pete, but Focus Right Europe is uh, inevitably going to be online this year. So uh, we were unable to host it in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago, but that will be on the 9th and 10th of September. That's focusrighteurope.com. Um, Pete? Anything so, that you want to say, or if I wrapped everything up? No, we are we are producing a ton of great events. The battleground is a lot of fun. Suhoon has, I think you're on what number twenty or twenty two or yeah. your, of your Wit Virtual series. So um, yeah. we're trying to bring all of this great content to you uh, in a lot of different ways and creative ways. The Wit Virtual Summit should be a ton of fun. So make sure you put that on your on your calendar. And I'd like to thank Marissa and Suhoon. And Kevin, it's always great to bring these fantastic brands together to produce uh, really nice events to, to help 
help the audience understand what's going on in the market for startups, for established companies across the travel industry. So we're all in this together and we will all make it through this together. So uh, th thank, thank you very much for, for attending. Okay, thank thanks, you, Pete. Pete. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, thank all you. right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.